The A Company of the Winnipeg Grenadiers was surrounded. They'd managed to claim the summit of Mount Butler in the center of Hong Kong and hold the invading Japanese for three hours. But a gap in their unprotected flank suddenly left them vulnerable. It was December 19th, 1941, and the war in the Pacific had just begun. The Winnipeg Grenadiers had been summoned, along with a Canadian sea force, to reinforce the defense of the British colony in the Far East. The Allies knew the Japanese could not be stopped, but still engaged them and halted their advance for as long as possible. Among the brave men was Sergeant Major John Robert Osborne, who put himself at risk by returning several enemy grenades to the Japanese during the bitter fight at the peak of Mount Butler. But then a final grenade hit the ground, one that the men knew would be almost impossible to reach and pick up. It was then that Osborne pushed a fellow soldier aside and jumped at the grenade while loudly yelling, quote, duck, lads. The enemy of my enemy. In the early 20th century, the British were uneasy about the expansion of Russia. Still, after the Russo-Japanese War, it was the Nippon Empire that emerged victorious and became a growing threat to the Western powers. By 1936, the Japanese had captured Manchuria and Inner Mongolia, and the Europeans began worrying about their colonies in the Far East. Making matters worse, they had also seized the Chinese cities of Beijing, Nanjing, and Shanghai. But the Chinese refused to surrender, and they resisted with the support of the Allies. When almost all their ports had been seized by the invaders, they received aid through one of their last operating harbors, Hong Kong. Prior to World War II, the island used to be a colony of the British Empire. Within two years, the invading forces kept getting nearer to Hong Kong, while Japan strived to cut off the Allied supply route to the Chinese. Moreover, the subsequent embargoes and economic sanctions imposed on Japan by the Western powers further eroded the relationship and led to an inevitable path to war. Meanwhile, the British built up their defenses, but the government was well aware that the Japanese were unstoppable and that their efforts to halt their advance would merely delay their victory. However, they put together a garrison that included British, Indian, and Chinese volunteer troops, making it a symbolic force. By 1941, reinforcements from the Canadian Army joined the defenders, bulking up their numbers to 14,000. In contrast, the Japanese had about 20,000 men, not including naval and air support. Unyielding. The Japanese expected to sweep the region within 10 days. They first conducted naval and aerial bombardments of key installations and then prepared the ground for a final land invasion. Early in the morning of December 8, 1941, the invasion began with the air bombardment of Kai Tak Airport, which destroyed most of the British aircraft. The garrison commander, Major General Christopher Maltby, had just learned about the attack on Pearl Harbor and the ensuing declaration of war. Maltby immediately ordered his troops to blow up all bridges and slow down the invasion, but the two British and two Indian Army battalions, one local Chinese regiment, and five infantry companies of the Hong Kong Volunteer Defense Corps lacked experienced officers to lead them to a successful defense. The battle for Hong Kong was lost before it had really begun. The Japanese were relentless, and despite the unexpectedly fierce opposition, they had secured a considerable part of the mainland territories by the afternoon. The encounter proved disastrous to the British. However, the defense had taken the Japanese by surprise, and they were not pleased to find more obstacles in their way. Still, for all their valiant efforts, the British, Indian, Canadian, and Allied Chinese troops had been cornered and retreated into the island by December 13th. The Japanese now held all of the mainland, but the colonial government refused to surrender. Instead, the defenders stood firmly in place, hoping that the presence of two battalions from the Canadian Sea Force would help them, and awaited the dreaded onslaught. Duty Calls John Robert Osborne was born in Norfolk, England in 1899. He first served in World War I in the Royal Navy Volunteer Division and then moved to Canada, where he lived as a farmer. Osborne first lived in Saskatchewan and then moved to Winnipeg, where he worked for the Canadian Pacific Railway 
when the tensions in Europe came to a boiling point, he was quick to enlist in a non-permanent active militia unit, the Winnipeg Grenadiers, in 1933. By the time he turned 42 and World War II broke out in 1939, Osborne was a warrant officer second class, holding an appointment as company sergeant major for A Company in the 1st Battalion. The Grenadiers were then placed on active duty. For a while, they were on station in Bermuda and later in Jamaica until the situation in the Far East called for assistance. Then, at the request of the British government, the battalion was deployed to Hong Kong in October of 1941 as part of the Sea Force, the first Canadians to see combat during World War II. The Japanese conducted their first attack attempt on Hong Kong Island on December 15th, but it was swiftly thwarted by machine gun fire. However, they came back and struck with all their might three days later. The invaders prepared for their main assault under the cover of a dense black smoke curtain left by the explosion of oil storage tanks. Then, on the night of the 18th, they organized into two assault units and sailed in small crafts, paddling toward the Tycho duckyard from the west and east. The fleet remained undetected for half the distance, but disembarked successfully nonetheless. By midnight, three enemy regiments had landed on Hong Kong Island. White Flag The British High Command had placed its headquarters in the center of the island, in the area known as the Wong Ne Chang Gap, from where they control the entire perimeter. Thus, when the Japanese breached the coastal defenses an inch closer to the main command on December 19th, the Winnipeg Grenadiers stepped in. They were dispatched to intercept the enemy at Jardine's Lookout, a key mountain at the valley's entrance. Still, the more powerful enemy soon forced the Canadians to retreat into the surrounding pillboxes as they occupied the hilltop. And despite enduring significant losses, the Japanese overwhelmed the defenders, who held their ground in their fortified positions until it was impossible to carry on. Eventually, the enemy pushed them back into the gap, but the Canadians gathered their remaining strength to counterattack. Osborne's A Company was ordered to move to Jardine's Lookout Mountain, and after dislodging the enemy, they were tasked with retaking Mount Butler. Past dawn, Osborne led part of A Company, which had been divided in the fight, in a bayonet charge, and successfully seized the summit of Mount Butler. The Canadians held their position for three hours. And during heavy fighting, the Sergeant Major was reportedly calm while directing protective fire and managed to keep the enemy at bay for a while. However, they had to surrender the height after three enemy companies retaliated, forcing the Canadians down the western slope. By then, Osborne and his men finally rejoined the rest of the company, but the Japanese had already surrounded the group. The Canadians had repelled two attacks, but now faced an ammunition shortage, and the casualties were mounting. Irremediably, Company Commander Major A.B. Gresham was forced to surrender, and as he walked and stood in the open while waving a white flag, the Japanese shot him. Ultimate Sacrifice The Canadian emplacement became untenable the moment the Japanese attacked from an unprotected flank. Meanwhile, the sergeant major and a small group stayed to cover their comrades' withdrawal until the moment came to fall back. Osborne single-handedly engaged the enemy to allow the rest of his men to rejoin the company. As the London Gazette reported, quote, Osborne had to run the gauntlet of heavy rifle and machine gun fire. With no consideration for his own safety, he assisted and directed stragglers to the new company position, exposing himself to heavy enemy fire to cover their retirement. Wherever danger threatened, he was there to encourage his men. During the intense combat, the company was cut off from the battalion and completely surrounded by the Japanese. The enemy began harassing the slight depression the company was holding with constant grenades. As the devices reigned in their position, the sergeant major kept picking them up one by one and throwing them back at the enemy. However, soon one grenade landed in a spot where it was impossible to pick it up and dispose of it in time. Osborne didn't blink twice. Gallantly, and yelling at his men to warn them of the danger, he pushed one soldier aside and lunged at the explosive. His act of selflessness saved many lives that day, as he smothered the explosive with his own body and contained the detonation at the cost of his life. Capitulation <laughs> <laughs> 
The company maintained the defense as long as it could, but it had to retreat in the end. They suffered about 60 casualties, and many survivors were captured and taken as prisoners. Meanwhile, the Japanese advanced the gap and wiped out the British stronghold. With the fall of the center of the island, Maltby prepared for a massive counterattack with the remainder of his scattered forces across the island. The surviving units joined in a futile attempt to repel the Japanese, but for all their brave efforts, they also failed miserably. By the next morning, the invaders had consolidated their control over the central area, from where they would expand until they engulfed the island. Then, after extinguishing the remnants of the British opposition, the Japanese continued their advance for the following five days. The British authorities finally capitulated on the so-called Black Christmas, as any further resistance was pointless. After the official surrender, the Japanese occupied the territories for over three years until their ultimate surrender at the end of the Pacific War. Still, their victory came at the cost of roughly 3,000 casualties, a highly unexpected loss, considering they had envisaged close to no opposition during the invasion. In contrast, the Allies lost well over that figure. Thanks for watching our video. Don't hesitate to subscribe to Dark Docs for many more heroic anecdotes from the world wars and beyond. And check out our other Dark Documentaries channels for many more exciting military and technological stories. Also, please give us a thumbs up and hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. Stay tuned.